Okay, uh, I guess we should uh, we should get going. So this is the second part uh, of the uh, aerosol modeling course. Uh, so again, uh, relatively general, not too, too many details for uh, on the, on the different parameterizations. But feel free to ask me questions uh, if you want uh, if you want more details or or, we, or any questions really. So uh, on Monday we've seen that uh, characterizing aerosols is not a very easy thing to do. There are a lot of properties that we need to get right and to know uh, in order to, to have a useful model. So that's the mass, uh, the number, the size of the aerosol, uh, the, chemical, the chemical composition. And uh, then we started uh, looking at, uh, at the aerosol life cycle with uh, the emissions of, uh, of anthropogenic species, which are based on uh, inventories. So uh, now we'll move on to uh, the emission of natural aerosols and then the different processes that happen in the atmosphere, uh, including the removal of the aerosols uh, from the atmosphere. And then uh, I will talk a bit about uh, validation, uh, depending on the time uh, we've got. Okay, so let's start uh, with uh, uh, the emissions of, uh, of a very important uh, in terms of uh, total mass and total number uh, aerosol species, which is uh, sea salt. Uh, so here you've got uh, two uh, pictures uh, summarizing the processes uh, whereby uh, aerosols, uh, sea salt aerosols are emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, so the first one is uh, what we call uh, the, the, fil uh, the film mode uh, emission process. So what happens is that uh, because uh, of, uh, of waves, for example, out at sea, uh, some air bubbles can be uh, uh, sent uh, underwater. So you, you, you can imagine a, a wave and uh, uh, basically imprisoning air uh, uh, underwater. And uh, of course, uh, the bubble will, uh, will rise uh, back to the surface. And when it arrives at the surface, it will burst. And the first of the film of water around the, the air bubble will be uh, the, uh, the process by which uh, you emit uh, uh, some of the sea salt uh, aerosol. So the, the sea salt is. Uh, dissolved in seawater, and the, the bursting of this film will emit the, the particles into the atmosphere. Uh, this process is mainly responsible for the emission of uh, accumulation mode or the, the smaller aerosol sizes. Then there is uh, another process uh, which, uh, which uh, f follows directly, and here what happens is that as the bubble bursts, it leaves uh, a void in terms of, uh, of water. And this void will be filled by a jet of seawater uh, going out into the atmosphere. I mean, we're not talking about massive jet. Of course, it's a, it, we're, we're talking relatively uh, small, uh, small sizes. And that jet is able to uh, emit into the atmosphere small uh, droplets of seawater, which are, in effect, uh, uh, sea salt aerosols. And here, this process is uh, responsible for the emission of uh, coarse modes, so larger sizes, uh, of the aerosol of, uh, of sea salt. There is a third process, which is a bit less important, again, again emitting, emitting relatively large particles. And uh, this is uh, simply uh, uh, the uh, direct ejection of uh, small seawater droplets uh, from the crests of, uh, of the waves, only, uh, only at very uh, relatively high wind speeds. So the way uh, those processes are represented in, in models, so they are parameterized, so we don't, uh, we don't uh, resolve the mechanics of those processes, at least not in, uh, in global models. Uh, in the, uh, ECM WFIFS, there are some model uh, used in the MAC project. Uh, the parameterization is, uh, is shown here for uh, following uh, Monohan et al. And, uh, 86. And uh, the idea is to parameterize the uh, emission flux uh, as a function of wind speed 
because wind speed uh, varies a lot uh, uh, vertically in the atmosphere, uh, typically you need uh, uh, to parameterize as a function of the wind speed at a given height, and the uh, typical value is, uh, is the wind speed at 10 meters. Uh, those parameterization are, are, are uh, taken uh, from, uh, from observations, so they are basically uh, empirical fits uh, to, uh, to uh, observe the emissions. Uh, uh, they could also be uh, 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 taken from uh, laboratory experiments. Uh, so in Mac, uh, the emissions are, ca are calculated in terms of number. So this formula here gives you the number of particles emitted as a function of wind speed uh, and the particle radius uh, for, a particle, uh, for a given uh, particle radius. Uh, and then to, uh, to get the, the uh, mass emitted, you simply assume that these salt aerosols are spherical. So you can have the, the total volume of the number of particles emitted, and uh, you use a constant density uh, of uh, about a uh, little bit more than uh, two metric tons uh, per uh, cubic meters uh, to get your, uh, your emitted number. So uh, what does it look in, uh, in terms of uh, distribution? So the wind speed, the 10 meter wind speed is, uh, is the main uh, parameter uh, used in, uh, in those estimates. So here is the distribution of 10 meter wind speed over the ocean. Of course, this is where uh, the seawater is. Uh, for the month of uh, April 2003, and you see the, the, uh, the expected uh, distribution, so relatively high wind speeds at, uh, at uh, high latitudes, or around the roaring uh, 40s and 50s, both in the, in the north and south hemisphere, and lower wind speeds typically uh, in the tropical regions. And the emissions uh, are derived directly uh, for, uh, from those wind speeds. So, so the distribution, the pattern of distribution is relatively uh, similar uh, with uh, the stronger emissions uh, in the Southern Ocean and in uh, the North and uh, North Atlantic and uh, Pacific Ocean. Another uh, natural aerosols that, we, uh, uh, that uh, is included in the model and, uh, and whose emissions are computed uh, interactively is uh, mineral dust. So here, the processes of emissions of uh, mineral dust are, are, are different, although they are also uh, driven by wind speed. So first, it starts uh, with uh, the creeping of the particles. So wind basically uh, makes uh, this very small, uh, well actually relatively large sand grains roll onto the surface. So that's an horizontal flux of particles. Uh, some of that uh, may be uh, emitted into the atmosphere, but the main process is that the larger particles get lifted, uh, not, not very high, but they get lifted a little bit and then fall back down and at impact, they eject smaller particles into the atmosphere. That's called the saltation process. And uh, this is uh, the main way to emit mineral dust into the atmosphere. Saltation can also happen if you have a large aggregate of uh, mineral dust particles that is lifted, comes back down to the surface, and then disintegrates on impact and emits the uh, smaller particles uh, into, uh, into the atmosphere. And then when, once they have been uh, emitted, they are distributed ver vertically uh, by uh, turbulent fluxes and uh, convective activity. So there are uh, parameterization uh, to uh, represent uh, those processes in the model. Uh, here is the one that is used in, uh, in the uh, MAC uh, IFS aerosol model. And uh, it's uh, at the simple end of the range of, uh, of parameterization. The idea is that there is a threshold wind speed above which you start uh, emitted, uh, <coughs> emitting aerosols. 
So this threshold wind speed can be computed uh, as a function of, uh, of, uh, of soil moisture, for example. So the drier the soil, uh, the easier it gets uh, to, to lift particles. Can be also computed as a, f as a fraction of vegetation. So vegetation will, uh, will, uh, will make it more difficult to, uh, to, to emit the particles. Uh, then, if your uh, wind speed is uh, above this threshold value, then in the MAC uh, parameterization, this direct function of the wind speed with some uh, emission potential, which is taken constant, although there exists a more um, a sophisticated parameterization when that emission potential is computed from the soil moisture, uh, the roughness length of the soil, so basically uh, uh, vegetation again will prevent uh, uh, just from being uh, lifted. Uh, but uh, so in MAC it's a relatively uh, uh, simple parameterization and the source areas of dust are fixed. So they are, deter they are predetermined and we only allow dust emissions in given areas. Uh, it's okay for a model that is applied for uh, short-term forecast and, uh, and, uh, and uh, for uh, present-day conditions. Obviously, if you want to, uh, to uh, look at the impact of climate change on your uh, dust emissions, uh, you would need, uh, you, you, you should avoid fixing the uh, source areas of dust, uh, otherwise you will not have the full response of climate change onto the Earth. So this is uh, how the uh, dust emission field looks in the model again for the, mom again on, uh, for the month of April 2003. Uh, so you see that distribution, no, no surprise there. The main desert areas uh, uh, are, uh, are shown and uh, the Sahara, of course, is, uh, is the main uh, source of, uh, of mineral dust in, uh, in the atmosphere. But there are some strong local sources, like for example, uh, in the Gobi Desert uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, northwestern China uh, and some uh, sources as well uh, in South America, South Africa and, uh, and Australia. So there are uh, other natural emissions that uh, you may want to include uh, in your model de depending on its level of uh, sophistication. Uh, for uh, the first one uh, is uh, the uh, emissions of the DMS. So it is a gas that is uh, uh, emitted uh, by uh, uh, phytoplankton in, in the ocean. Uh, here, uh, there are uh, different ways to do that. You can either uh, uh, prescribe a distribution of uh, chlorophyll in, in, uh, in, uh, in, your, uh, in your ocean, uh, or you can have uh, actually an interactive representation of phytoplankton in your model. Uh, DMS uh, oxidizes uh, into SO2, which is then a precursor of uh, sulfate uh, aerosols. Another source of, uh, of, uh, of uh, secondary aerosols, that's the emission of uh, VOCs, uh, vola volatile organic compounds, uh, mainly from uh, uh, vegetation, biogenic emissions, Again, there are quite a few uh, uh, parameterization available in the literature. A uh, lot of uncertainties. Uh, typically, uh, it uh, depends on the, on the temperature and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the health of the vegetation in, uh, in many ways. Uh, so th those emissions are precursors to secondary organic aerosols. Uh, uh, finally, ammonia. Uh, ammonia is, uh, is uh, emitted by our activities, mainly agriculture, but also uh, by the ocean and uh, by uh, wild animals. And uh, those, uh, those sources, uh, in general, are given as inventories, uh, and this is, uh, ammonia is a precursor of, of nitrate aerosols. Uh, none of those emissions are included in the IF IFS schemes, but uh, mainly large-scale climate models uh, have them uh, now. So now that the aerosol has been emitted into the atmosphere, uh, we are entering really the life cycle of aerosols into uh, the atmosphere. So there are elements of uh, atmospheric chemistry, so that's the transformation, the oxidation, of precursors 
into aerosols. Then you've got uh, conversion uh, from the gas phase to the aerosols, so that be, can be either nucleation or condensation, and we'll see what uh, those are in a minute. Uh, then once you are in the aerosol phase, things uh, do not stop there. You, can, you have transformation of your, your, your aerosols, so they are processed in clouds, uh, they uh, undergo coagulation and aging. Uh, they are, uh, the aerosols are transported, of course, uh, along the, uh, the, uh, the dynamics of the atmosphere. And finally, they are uh, deposited, what we call uh, sinks. So the, the, uh, this is the, the arrow that opposes and balances uh, the emissions. And there are uh, different ways to, uh, to remove aerosols from the atmosphere, and we'll see uh, those uh, as well. So let's start with uh, oxidation. So here we are in the realm of uh, atmospheric chemistry. Uh, the two main uh, oxidation pathways are from uh, SO2 uh, to uh, sulfate aerosols uh, via uh, sulfuric acid in general. So uh, SO2 is oxidized into sulfuric acid uh, uh, in, uh, in, well, in the dry conditions, but uh, let's say outside clouds uh, by OH, the uh, hydroxyl radical. And then SO2 undergoes oxidation within clouds uh, uh, with, uh, by uh, uh, reacting with uh, hydrogen peroxide and, uh, and ozone. The, um, the other pathway of oxidation, in terms of the main pathways, uh, is uh, are uh, volatile organic compounds, so that's the isoprene and terpenes emitted by, uh, by vegetations. Uh, they are oxidized uh, by uh, OH and ozone again, uh, but also uh, uh, by uh, nitrate. So the way to represent those oxidation processes depends again very much on the sophistication of the model. You can either just use prescribed and constant oxidation rates, so, let's, for example, uh, in the MAC uh, model, uh, oxidation of SO2 into sulfate uses a, cons a time constant of 1.16 days. Uh, <coughs> you can resolve the oxidation, but not the concentration of oxidants. So, you can impose the concentration of oxidants and they stay fixed, although you can uh, introduce uh, a seasonal or monthly variation in your data set. Uh, or you can have a full interactive chemistry scheme, as, uh, such as the ones uh, uh, Paul Monks, uh, Paul Monks uh, uh, talked about, in which case you've got a full interactive link between uh, atmospheric chemistry and uh, aerosol physics. Nucleation, so that's another way to go from the gas phase to the aerosol phase. So nucleation is simply the formation of an aerosol nucleus. So the really the, the beginning of an aerosol uh, 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 particle as a, a cluster of ions. You've got two modes of uh, nucleations, mainly. Uh, you've got, uh, uh, how does that put it out here? Uh, unimolecular uh, nu um, uh, nucleation, so that's only one uh, species uh, clustering uh, on, on itself. Or you, have, you can have uh, binary or bimolecular nucleation, which involves two gases, typically, for example, sulfuric acid and, uh, and water. So uh, the, complex, uh, the, 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 the process of nucleation is relatively complex in terms of its uh, physics, its dynamics, its kinetics. Uh, and it's uh, not still uh, fully uh, understood. For a long time, we thought that a nucleation only happened in the higher layers of the troposphere, so in the, in the free troposphere. Uh, but now we have strong evidence that it is also an important uh, process uh, in, the boundary, uh, in the boundary layer. And what we have, since we don't have a full understanding uh, of the physics of the process, what we use are uh, empirical uh, relationships uh, between the concentration of uh, the gases that nucleate and uh, the uh, emission, well, the particle creation rate uh, that follows. Uh, 
So those parameterization are typically a function of the gas concentration, as I said, uh, but also temperature and, uh, and, uh, and moisture. Uh, current <coughs> MAC model doesn't have uh, this process, but it is more and more included in, in the main climate models. Condensation, that's the last way to go from the gas phase to the aerosol phase. So here, the idea is that when you've got uh, an aerosol particle already in the atmosphere, then you can condense gas onto uh, that particle. Uh, typically, uh, this is a dominant process in terms of transfer from the gas phase to the aerosol phase. It dominates over nucleation, uh, except, obviously, when you don't have many pre-existing pre uh, aerosols. Uh, the, the process uh, physically is, uh, is understood and uh, can be computed uh, using the, the, the Kelvin uh, equation. So you can compute the saturated water pressure uh, that you need uh, for your uh, gas to condense into the particle. Uh, it's uh, uh, this uh, 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 vapor pressure, sorry, uh, is uh, inversely, inversely proportional to the particle radius. So it's, in, it's, it's much easier to condense onto, uh, uh, onto uh, a, a large particle than uh, uh, onto a smaller one. Uh, so there are uh, parameterization for it, but again, this process is not explicitly uh, represented in the uh, aerosol scheme, but is represented in, in, in many other models. So once we are in the aerosol phase, there are still uh, things uh, happening. The first thing uh, that goes from the aerosol phase to the aerosol phase is coagulation. And that's simply uh, the formation of a larger particle out of uh, a few uh, smaller particles. So they stick together and they form uh, a larger aerosol. So that's mainly driven uh, by uh, temperature, so that's uh, by Brownian motion, so the, uh, the amount of, uh, of, uh, of kinetic energy you, uh, that, uh, that you have to, uh, to move your uh, particles at random in the atmosphere. Uh, this is uh, an important process uh, in, uh, in polluted regions, where, so where the uh, aerosol concentrations are large. Uh, this can also be an important process where the aerosols stay long for a long time in the atmosphere. So, for example, uh, in the stratosphere, uh, it's an important process. Uh, again, there are parameterization. I will not go into details and uh, not explicitly represented in the MAC aerosol model. So, Clouds are, uh, are very important in uh, the uh, life cycle of the aerosols. Uh, although you can uh, also see the, the opposite is that aerosols are very uh, important in the life cycle of clouds, since most liquid clouds form onto existing aerosol <coughs> particles. But clouds play a role, so we've seen in, uh, in the uh, aqueous phase oxidation of uh, aerosol precursors, for, uh, for example, uh, SO2. Uh, within clouds, you also have uh, processes like coagulation of an aerosol, which is not already in cloud water, so in, in interstitial aerosol, so it's between the cloud droplets, and it can coagulate with a cloud droplet. And if uh, the cloud is, uh, is not precipitating, and your droplet eventually re-evaporates, you can end up with uh, a larger aerosol that you had uh, at the start of the cycle when the uh, droplet formed. So this it is a way to, uh, to move the size distribution of the aerosols towards larger particles, and this is also a way to increase the degree of mixture, uh, so uh, uh, the mixing state uh, of your aerosol particles. Uh, so it's mainly important in non-precipitating non clouds, sorry. Uh, so basically stratiform clouds like uh, stratus or stratocumulus. Then uh, aging. So aging is basically the transition between an insoluble aerosol 
two uh, soluble aerosols. So two reasons for, for why the solubility can change. First, because you condense soluble material onto your insoluble aerosol, so it gets coated with soluble materials and becomes, in effect, uh, partly soluble itself. And also be, uh, uh, because of coagulation, so two aerosols sticking together between uh, an insoluble uh, aerosol and a soluble aerosol. So, in effect, aging is a, is a change in the mis mixing state of the aerosols, moving from external mixture towards more internal, uh, internal uh, mixture. So, it can also it can be represented, uh, 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 it can be resolved uh, in, in a model that is sophisticated enough, uh, simply if you resolve uh, the condensation and coagulation processes. Uh, in the, in the MAC uh, model, uh, we use, uh, again, a constant uh, aging time scale from an hydrophobic, so insoluble mode of carbonaceous aerosols and an hydrophilic mode uh, with a constant time scale. Uh, so this is a very simplified uh, representation. And the main av advantage is that it's very cheap to run. Uh, and in a way, it is a, it is a way to implicitly represent uh, processes like condensation, coagulation, and the uh, in-cloud process. OK, so once you've formed your aerosols and they've grown for, uh, by, uh, by uh, different ways, uh, the, 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 the aerosols just don't sit in the atmosphere. They are obviously transported with uh, air masses. Uh, transport uh, is due uh, to uh, first the general circulation of the atmosphere. So you've got the main cells, like the Hadley cell, uh, that uh, transports uh, air masses uh, around. Uh, transport uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in our mid-latitudes is mainly driven by weather systems. Uh, in the tropics uh, and in the summer of our land, uh, they are more driven by convective processes, especially uh, vertically. Um, so a good <coughs> transport scheme in, uh, in a model, and obviously the transport scheme is applied to, uh, to, uh, to uh, all model tracers, so it's, it's applied to moisture, it's applied <coughs> to uh, gases, uh, and it's applied to, uh, to aerosols. It's uh, also applied to uh, cloud particles. And a good uh, transport scheme should, of course, uh, conserve mass. So you should not lose mass uh, for numerical reason in, in, uh, uh, while you are transporting uh, your stuff. Uh, it's not such an easy thing to do, actually, to, uh, to conserve mass in a, in a transport scheme. Uh, and also avoid uh, things like negative concentrations, etc. So there's, there's a whole science uh, in designing those transports. And hopefully, uh, you should be able to reproduce the main uh, transport pathways that uh, are observed uh, uh, across the globe uh, on a seasonal basis. So, for example, in winter, you you are expected to reproduce the transport of pollution from North America uh, towards Europe, uh, European po pollution from, uh, from Europe uh, towards the Arctic or the Mediterranean, depending on, on the synoptic situation. Then you've got uh, transport uh, from China across the Pacific and transport of uh, mineral dust and biomass burning aerosols uh, from uh, uh, West Africa towards uh, South America. So that's uh, in North Hemisphere winter. In North Hemisphere summer, uh, transport uh, is, is, uh, is slightly different. So again, uh, transport from North America to Europe, but slightly more to the south than, uh, than in winter. Uh, transport from Europe towards uh, the west and from China again across the Pacific. Uh, mineral dust uh, in summer is typically transported across the Atlantic uh, towards the Caribbean. Uh, biomass burning is, is small transport uh, from the land into the Gulf of Guinea uh, in Africa, and then transport uh, from the Amazon regions towards uh, uh, southeastern uh, Brazil. 
So, uh, Paul Monks mentioned uh, the importance of transport in terms of air quality and the uh, H HTAP, so Hemispheric Transport of Air Pollution Initiative. Here, here, is, uh, 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 here are some results from, uh, from, uh, from that uh, exercise. So here in this table, it gives the percentage of the aerosol optical depth, so that's basically a metric uh, used uh, by optical instrument to, uh, to measure the amount of aerosols. So the amount of optical depth uh, that is due uh, to a long range transport. So those aerosols are not local aerosols, they've been emitted far away and transported. So here it is for uh, uh, different species, uh, sulfate, organic carbon, and black carbon. Uh, and you see that, for example, in, in North America, 16% uh, of sulfate uh, is uh, uh, of, uh, of a distant origin, typically uh, from, uh, from East Asia, uh, and uh, etc. Et in different regions. So North America will import pollution typically from East Asia, <coughs> Europe typically from North America, South Asia will, uh, will import uh, pollution from Europe and East Asia, and East Asia will import pollution from South Asia and Europe. And uh, so first you can see that the amount of pollution due to long range transport can be relatively large. It can be up to 30%. Uh, you can also see that uh, those standard deviations after the plus and minus sign are basically the diversity uh, in the different models used to get those numbers. So nine uh, global models have been used in that exercise. And you see that the diversity uh, in those models is very large compared to the uh, absolute uh, contribution of transport to local pollution. Uh, so that's basically, it shows the, the different, many different ways in which models uh, uh, reproduce aerosol removal processes because that's what will uh, mainly determine the length and duration of the transport. And, uh, and uh, it shows also that uh, we don't have much constraint uh, at the moment in terms of observation uh, on, uh, on the transport. So the differences in, uh, in transport are explained uh, by uh, the different uh, sink mechanisms, so the, the, the way you can remove the aerosols. So there are uh, typically four main ways you can get rid of aerosols in the atmosphere. Uh, first is what's called uh, dry deposition. So that's simply when the particle is uh, close to the surface, uh, it may enter some turbulent flow and impact the surface where in general it will stick. The second is uh, sedimentation. So sedimentation is, is also called uh, gravitational settling and it's simply the, the fact that uh, uh, the, um, the, the weight uh, of the particle will, will be in some equilibrium with the uh, aerodynamic resistance uh, 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 to, to, uh, to, uh, to a direct fall. Uh, and uh, depending on that e uh, equilibrium, you can have uh, sedimentation velocity and uh, your uh, your, uh, your, um, your particle eventually uh, reaches the surface. Then you have uh, two uh, uh, processes that happen uh, when uh, you have uh, precipitation, so uh, when clouds uh, precipitate. First, rain out, so that's when you remove the aerosols that are included in cloud droplets uh, as those cloud droplets fall with pre precipitation, while well you remove the aerosol uh, with them. The second one is the washout. So if you've got a precipitating cloud and an aerosol layer just below it, uh, those aerosols can be collected by the falling pre precipitation and uh, entrained in a way uh, uh, towards the surface. So uh, a question for you. Uh, what do you think is uh, the most efficient process in that list of four processes? What do you think is the most efficient at removing aerosols? Dry here. Dry here. Oh, wash out. Rain out. Oh, man. <laughs> as, as rain out, wash out. Wash out. Okay. <laughs> 
oil sand is a large of course our air source system is much more efficient because that's a, uh, simply it doesn't reach to the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, small particles can reach to the cloud and especially if it's a soluble, it can be efficiently removed by knife uh, manipulation uh, scavenging, which is a very hard. Otherwise, so simply, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. So, so, <laughs> so, so it depends. It is actually quite a good answer. Yes, it's true. Uh, obviously, for example, uh, uh, deposition by precipitation depends on the fact that you must have precipitation. Otherwise, it's not very efficient. Uh, and some sizes, some particle sizes, are more likely to be deposited by some process and uh, some processes, sorry, uh, than others. So uh, let's look uh, at, uh, let's run them in, in terms of uh, global average efficiency, if you prefer. So <coughs> typically, rain out and wash out uh, are the most efficient way to get rid of our source, <coughs> but obviously they depend on having precipitation in the first place. So in the absence of precipitation, sedimentation is, in, is relatively efficient but it's only uh, efficient for the coarser particles, for, for the larger particles, which are, which are basically uh, um, uh, heavy enough uh, to, uh, to uh, compensate for the, aero, uh, for the uh, aerodynamic resistance uh, uh, to their fall. Uh, so that's, that's true in the troposphere. Uh, in the stratosphere, because uh, the uh, aerosols stay much longer, and uh, the uh, vertical uh, transport in the, uh, in the stratosphere is much uh, slower than in the stratosphere, then sedimentation can become important for smaller ranges uh, like uh, accumulation mode particles. And finally, dry deposition is, is, is not very efficient in general except for the smaller particles, so uh, the ICANN mode aerosols. Uh, Paul Monk said uh, they were like gases, and in, in that case, it's, it's, it's not a bad uh, analogy. Uh, so they, they are very likely to be caught into, uh, into a turbulent flow and stick to the surface. Uh, speaking of sticking to the surface, uh, with suspension, so the aerosols that uh, are at the surface are, uh, and are emitted again uh, can be an important process uh, in some, uh, in, in some uh, um, cases, so typically a dry climate or in an urban uh, environment. Uh, um, so that's, uh, that's a way to, to, to counter a little bit the, the dry deposition uh, and sedimentation processes. Uh, another way uh, for uh, th that, uh, that mitigates the uh, wet deposition by rain out is the re-evaporation of precipitation. So not all uh, uh, precipitation reaches the surface. Uh, actually, uh, depending on the model, it can do up to 25% uh, of uh, precipitation actually re-evaporates before re reaching the ground. And of course, when you re-evaporate your droplet, then your aerosol is, uh, is, uh, is back into the atmosphere. And basically, then it becomes a way to redistribute uh, the vertical uh, profile of aerosol in the atmosphere. So here is an example of uh, a relatively complex aerosol scheme like those used in, uh, in, in quite a few uh, climate models nowadays. So to go through it uh, uh, quickly, aerosol, so aerosol mass and number are represented here, in this case, into five different modes. So a nucleation mode, an icon soluble mode, an accumulation soluble mode, a coarse soluble mode, and an icon insoluble mode. And the idea uh, of this kind of models is to, m is to represent all the transfer of mass from uh, one of those uh, five modes to either another mode or to uh, deposition fluxes. So in terms of emissions, you can have primary emissions to the modes. Typically, that's important for the carbonaceous aerosols. Uh, 
I forget to say that each mode uh, uh, represents the internal mixture of, uh, of different uh, uh, chemical compositions. So that's sulfate, black carbon, organic carbon, and sea salt in that case. So you've got uh, primary emissions. Then you represent all the processes that go uh, from the gas phase to the aerosol. So in this case, uh, nucleation, condensation, uh, in cloud uh, processing. Uh, uh, so that's for SO2 and uh, for VOCs on the right. And then you represent all the mass fluxes I've talked about, so from uh, aerosol to aerosols, so uh, the coagulation, uh, cloud processing, the aging, so aging from insoluble to soluble, and, uh, and then some more technical uh, things to make sure that each mode uh, covers the right uh, size ranges. So a way to uh, summarize this kind of, of scheme is to look at the mass budget. So basically try and follow the mass from uh, the emission to the deposition and see uh, where, uh, where it goes uh, mainly. So here is an example. So that's uh, the GLOMAP scheme. So there's a scheme I just showed before running in the HGM3 model. So that's the climate model of the Metaphys Hadley Center. And here is an example of the mass flux. So uh, starting, so you, you've got uh, primary emissions of SO2 here, which are not shown. And then you can go either towards the Aitken soluble mode for SO4 or the accumulation uh, soluble mode. And you see that typically uh, most of the mass goes from uh, sulfur dioxide into the accumulation soluble mode. Uh, via, uh, so the main way to transfer mass in, uh, is uh, via oxidation uh, in clouds uh, by uh, hydro hydrogen peroxide or ozone. There is uh, also relatively strong uh, condensation flux uh, <coughs> from SO2 to that mode. Condensation dominates the transfer from SO2 to the Aitken <coughs> soluble, so the smaller particles, and then the smaller particles get bigger either because they are processed in clouds, and that's the dominating process here, or because they uh, coagulate uh, together. And finally, the mass is uh, deposited. Uh, in this case, the main way to uh, uh, get rid of, uh, of the mass is via a wet deposition, so uh, 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 through precipitation of uh, accumulation soluble um, uh, sulfate. <coughs> So here, I, in this diagram, to simplify, otherwise there will be arrows everywhere, uh, I already show the main fluxes, so those uh, larger than two teragrams of SO4 per year. Uh, so I don't, some processes do not appear on the diagram, and one of them is nucleation, which only provides 0.1 teragram uh, of SO4 uh, per year as uh, nucleated new particles. So knowing that, uh, do you think that it means we can neglect that process and we don't need to represent it in our model, since it is such a small flux? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it, is a, it, is a, it is a good source of primary aerosol, yeah, yeah. Because they're in a situation. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yes, it's small in mass, but it's very important for number, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yes, you, you, got, you got everything. The other thing, of course, is those are global averages, and the process that can, be, can seem insignificant on the global average uh, can be important either regionally or in certain layer of the atmosphere. So some processes that are important in the boundary layer are less so in the free troposphere and vice versa. Same thing for uh, black carbon. So that's the mass budget of uh, black carbon in the same model. So here, uh, processes that are important as, uh, are slightly different, although all processes are represented uh, here. So the main pathway for the mass of black carbon is emissions <laughs> directly into uh, icon insoluble mode. Then transfer via aging. So aging, remember, 
condensa uh, condensation of soluble material and coagulation with other aerosols. So aging into now a soluble mode and then mass tends to coagulate or be processed in clouds into larger particles of the accumulation soluble modes which are then removed mostly uh, by wet deposition in, in that mode. And of course, uh, if you do the maths, you will see that uh, each stage, so each of these boxes uh, are balanced. So the amount of mass you get in is the same as the amount of mass you get out. Uh, so there is no, <laughs> no loss or creation of mass uh, in the model. So uh, to finish on that section, uh, one important thing that I, I didn't mention, or, or I mentioned a few times, so the, 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 the length of time, the, the lifetime of the aerosol, also called the residence time, so that the amount of time the aerosol remains in the atmosphere. Typically, it's, uh, it, is, uh, it can be c computed as a ratio, so the, that's the ratio of the burden. So the burden is basically the uh, aerosol mass integrated uh, over an atmospheric column. So that's in a way the, the, the aerosol mass that uh, weighs upon you. Uh, so the ratio of burden to uh, the deposition rate, and that gives you uh, the amount of time the aerosol remains in the atmosphere. So here the table shows uh, typical uh, residence time values for uh, the AROCOM1 models looking at anthropogenic aerosols only. And you see that uh, again the uh, standard deviation, the plus or minus signs, gives an idea of the diversity uh, between the different models. But typically you see that sulfate uh, remains on a global average about four days in the atmosphere and the uh, carbonaceous aerosols tend to remain uh, longer. So of course, uh, it depends. Uh, as the residence time depends very much on the efficiency uh, you can get at removing the aerosol. So whether you are in a dry region or, or wet region, uh, how high you are in the atmosphere, etc. Right. Uh, okay. So I've got uh, about five uh, five minutes to talk uh, about uh, model validation. So. Once you've made your, your great complex model, of course, uh, the, the first question is uh, how good is, is it and, uh, and do, do, I, do I have skill at modeling the aerosols for the application uh, I want? So the good news is that uh, over the last 20 years, uh, we have much, much more information on the aerosol distribution in the atmosphere than, uh, than before then. And that's thanks to, uh, to the deployment of uh, instruments on the ground, uh, thanks to uh, aircraft campaigns, which have now targeted the main uh, uh, our source, uh, source and trans transport regions, and uh, thanks to dedicated uh, satellite instruments, uh, which have flown uh, for a good number of years now, and can give you an idea of the aerosol climatology. Uh, so different instruments can give us different kinds of information. So here, for example, I show on the right, on side of the, uh, uh, of the slide, <coughs> uh, results from, uh, from the Ironet network. So that's a ground-based network on sun photometer. So they, they point at the sun, but also at constant angle. Uh, and they are able to retrieve, so those, those are not direct measurements, but uh, they are basically some, case, some other kind of model, if you prefer. Uh, they are able to retrieve some properties, like, for example, uh, the, uh, the aerosol absorption, so whether they are more scattering than absorbing. And in that, in that case here, you can, you, uh, what's, what it says is that uh, aerosols in, uh, in the uh, Goddard Space Flight Center in, in Maryland, in the US, are less absorbing than the aerosols you would find in uh, Mexico City. And uh, it is also able to, uh, to give us an idea of the size distribution of the aerosols. So basically, uh, the relative importance of the accumulation here and course mode uh, here on the right. We also have uh, 
chemical composition measurements, mainly, uh, mainly as part of, uh, of air quality networks, which can be uh, very useful. And I've shown on Monday already uh, this, uh, this nice summary by Jimenez of, uh, of uh, 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 chemical composition measurements across the world. Here is an example of Manchester in the UK. Then uh, satellite data, uh, they can give us uh, here on top uh, the, uh, the distribution of the aerosol optical depth. So the aerosol optical depth is a measure of, uh, of the extinction of radiation, so the absorption or scattering of radiation of aerosols uh, in the atmosphere. And it can be uh, estimated from, uh, from satellite data. And here you uh, I show uh, uh, d uh, distribution, uh, I don't remember exactly for which month it is, oh sorry, it's uh, for September 2012. And uh, so the optical depth in general is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a good, uh, 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 is a good measure of the amount of aerosols in the atmosphere, but in a column integrated way. Uh, so here you, you see, for example, biomass burning aerosols in Africa and, and, uh, and South America, and uh, you've got a little bit of, uh, transport of uh, mineral dust here. Uh, some satellites are able also to distinguish between different aerosol types. So here is a result from, uh, from the parasol instrument, which is able to distinguish between spherical and non-spherical aerosols. So remember that shape was one of the properties we, we wanted no knowledge of. So both those measurements from satellites, since, since satellites tend, uh, tend to look uh, down uh, and uh, have an integrated view of the atmosphere, so we don't have much information on the vertical profile, but uh, we've, we also have uh, LIDARs now uh, flying in space that can, can have given us good climatologies of the profile of the aerosol. So here, for example, uh, the instruments has flown uh, over the uh, southeastern Atlantic and uh, you can easily distinguish uh, a, a plume of aerosols, most likely biomass burning aerosols transported from Africa, and those aerosols overlie <coughs> a thin layer of uh, stratocumulus clouds. So that's very, uh, very useful information to have. So how, you can, how can we use uh, this kind of information to uh, validate models? Well, a few, uh, few examples. Here, for example, uh, is uh, the comparison of uh, measured uh, on the x-axis and observed on the y-axis uh, aerosol concentrations at the surface. Uh, this is from, uh, from a climate model, the Earth system model of the, of the Hadley Center. And this is uh, for sulfate at the top, so this is four seasons, uh, sulfate, nitrate, black carbon, and organic carbon. And the source of uh, data for the comparisons are typically uh, air quality or background uh, air quality uh, monitoring sites, so EMAP, uh, which covers Europe, and IMPROVE and CASNET, uh, which cover uh, North America. Uh, and you see, for example, uh, in that instance, that uh, in many cases, uh, the, uh, the aerosol concentrations are within a factor two in the model, within a factor two. Uh, uh, of the observations, although you can perhaps see uh, some underestimate of sulfate in winter uh, and some uh, an overestimate of, uh, of nitrate uh, in uh, winter and spring uh, as well. Um, also optical depth, so it is measured both uh, on the ground or uh, from satellites. Here is uh, an example for uh, the uh, MAC model, so the uh, IFS with aerosols, against aeronet, so that's ground-based uh, measurements of the optical depth. In this case, uh, this is uh, root mean square error uh, of the model against the measurements. In, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in blue is a free-running model, so that's a model that uh, forecasts the aerosol <coughs> on its own. And in red, it is when uh, uh, optical depth is also assimilated by a retrieval, so you would expect an improvement is a skill. Uh, and indeed, you get that with, uh, with, the, with the red model, so the data assimilated model, typically having, having uh, smaller uh, root mean square errors uh, 
than uh, the free running mode. Uh, another example here, uh, this kind, uh, this, uh, yeah, this kind, this time uh, against uh, uh, aircraft data. So that's aircraft measurement of aerosol number, and here that's the number for particles that are larger than uh, three nanometers in in, weight in in dry radius. So uh, most of the icon mode and uh, and and then of larger particles. Uh, you've got. Uh, the observations or the aircraft observations as for, for uh, uh, somewhere in the, in, in the Pacific. And you've got the vertical profile of the aerosol number. So the observations as, as, uh, as, uh, as those uh, smooth crosses and uh, the model in color. And uh, you can see that the model does well in some regions, less well in others. Uh, Another, uh, another example, so that's a very useful thing that we have now is the ability to constrain and validate the vertical distribution of the aerosol in the atmosphere against observation. Uh, so, sorry, I forgot to, that's uh, from uh, Brigitte Coffey's paper in 2012. Uh, here, so they built a climatology of uh, aerosol LIDAR profiles uh, from, uh, from the Calypso instrument. Uh, which is shown here in black, so that's the aerosol extinction, so the amount of, uh, of interaction with, uh, with radiation, if we wish, uh, 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 as a function of the altitude, so in black uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the observations and in color in, uh, in the models. And you see that uh, typically models do uh, very different profiles, and that's why this kind of constraint is useful. And you, s you, s you also see that uh, models uh, very often tend to put, uh, oops, sorry, tend to put the aerosol mass uh, a little bit too high up in the atmosphere. Uh, models in terms of uh, vertical transport uh, are often too diffusive, so they tend to be too eager at putting aerosol mass uh, aloft. And uh, okay, that's it uh, for me. Uh, just a few, f a couple of books that uh, will give you much more detailed information on top of uh, the papers I've, uh, I've, uh, I've cited as well. So there's of course uh, the, the, the big book on atmospheric chemistry and physics by, uh, by Seinfeld and Pandis. Uh, and also in French, there's a, there's a nice, uh, nice uh, book uh, uh, published last year by uh, Olivier Boucher, uh, which is more targeted than uh, on aerosol. Uh, this is one of the books I, I used to to prepare this, this course. So thank you, and if you have any questions, please do ask them either now or later when you meet me. Okay?